was it inside the nightclub that you were situated above that you met these uh, ladies? Some of them, yeah. Um, some of them were ones who were coming through the checkpoint and like if they were dropping off a delivery or something, if they were there for a few hours, like, you know, one thing led to another, <laughs> you know, and I do remember like, I don't know how much detail you want about this, but like, I do remember space was an issue and people were always looking for like empty offices or closets to bang in and <laughs> stuff like this. So, no, I, yeah. Uh, that, that adds up to different conditions. And also, I think you mentioned something about the, the ladies there, some of them having uh, purposefully been genetically modified to look like certain ETs. And was that, did they make them more attractive or what was the thinking there? There's people, xenophilia is a big thing in space. So there's a lot of people who are specifically, they have a fetish for aliens or people who look like aliens. So that's basically what's behind that. You're, yourself included? <laughs> I I did to an extent. Um, yeah, there were some aliens I was really into. Um, what but, What species were you into in that way? There's one species that they look mostly like us, but they have rainbow skin. I have no idea what conditions they developed in to, that led to that, but they're quite attractive and they're really good in bed. <laughs> the females are. And um, uh, who, who was your best partner? Was it a uh, human or was it an ET? That's a tough one. I'd say ETs because telepathy adds a whole other element to sex that like you, you feel each other's pleasure not just your own and so it adds a it makes it a lot more intense it's like in our tantra traditional you know teachings yeah yeah so it makes it also i heard last seemingly much longer it can take like the equivalent of weeks whereas it's just a few minutes have passed is that is that true yes and so the the ets were more inclined to be able to do that yes and at that point it's not even so much about the looks maybe or am i wrong you, no you're not wrong there were uh, there's some ets like there's a species that they look like a bucket of goo with eyes and teeth like i I don't care how good in bed you are. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> to an extent, it wasn't really about looks. <laughs> well, anything above above that is fair game. If it's roughly humanoid, I'll I'm willing to at least give it a try. <laughs> well, and what about the girls at your workplace? Were they also, you know, Put, putting out <laughs> <laughs> yeah they were my family just pulled in let's do part two of this in a couple of days um yeah sure sounds good okay. anyway you did really good thank you so let's just pick up where we left off which was i was curious whether there were gravity plating throughout your location on europa and did you also get to see many other towns there on that moon? No, not on Europa. Uh, I didn't get to see... Well, I got to see an abandoned one on the surface once. Um, but yes, there was gravity plating. And they kept it at about Earth standard gravity. Maybe a it, tiny bit less. Yeah, because humans are allegedly meant for a little less than ours. Yeah. And who docked in the huge landing pad in the 
solar warden base uh, generally. I heard it was even ships from other galaxies. Yeah. Uh, anyone and everyone using the Jupiter wormhole uh, would dock there unless their ship was too big. And if that was the case, then they would park in orbit of Europa and our team would go up onto their ship to do the registration process. All right. And this this Jupiter wormhole is that's the reason for the base's placement in the first yeah. place, right? Yes. And is it safe to say it's the most important one in the solar system? Probably the one next to the sun is about on the same level, but other than that, yeah, I would and say. And how how far does it take you, uh, as compared to the one in the sun? I have memories of well. The memories of the one from the sun are from Dark Fleet, and I have a lot fewer memories of locations where I was in that phase. Um, the one by Jupiter, it can take you, I believe, as far as the Pegasus galaxy. And how does it work? Do you have to go to a certain window of time for it to take you in a different place than another, or...? Okay, this is really hard to explain, but basically when you enter a wormhole, you see streams. They look like streams of light going in different directions. Like and anyone can see them? Yes, but you have to be able to control your ship enough to go along one of those streams, and it'll take you... At the end of that stream is a location. So you're not depending on time. You can use that one portal to go to multiple locations. Yes. And is it natural or built by the ancient builder race? Uh, this one, I believe, was built by the ancient builder race. And is there a noticeable difference? And what would you say is the more reliable one? Artificial ones, by far, are more reliable. Naturally occurring ones are very dangerous. Like, they, they do actually change where they lead all the time. Uh, they open and close with no predictable pattern. They're very dangerous, and we avoid them whenever possible. How about do you ever make your own portals via the ship? Yeah, we can. But over shorter distances, of course. Yeah. And... Let's go into what your job actually entailed there. How did you get trained for it? And has it ever changed during your stay there? I believe that the training programming must have been already in there as a part of the artificial personality. Because as soon as that clone was printed, he was put to work and he just knew naturally what to do. Um, and no, it didn't really change. But what I did was there would be a ship that would come through and I would basically be the guy who's... You know how when you go to another country, there's a guy who checks your passport, who says, okay, uh, how much luggage do you have? Are you carrying anything that needs to be declared? Do you have any weapons? If you have any, I need to see your license to carry them. All of that? Yeah, usually in airports. Yes. I was that guy, but for the solar system, basically. So you, it was that simple? Yeah. Usually it was for um, ETs, so it would usually be me saying this telepathically. But sometimes they were English-speaking uh, ETs, and sometimes they were SSP groups. Uh, right, right. Then did you ever get like bonuses or incentives and was competition generally encouraged? Yeah, it was. Um, competition was. I, for payment, we had a credit system, not like actual currency. We had credits that were based on productivity and also um, competence at our job. But it must have been good for more than just, you know, like brownie points or whatever. It must have been actionable. Yes, we could buy things. There were shops on the base and stuff. And 
Did the routine of doing the same thing ever get boring or did the variety of the ETs you interacted with uh, keep it from becoming a Groundhog Day scenario? Uh, it got real boring real fast. <laughs> there, uh, there was... I mean, there was a lot of variety, but it was usually the same few people coming and going. It was only so the, occasionally that there would be something really wow. Were there any like oddball events, like say ET invasions or like really strong weather events or what have you? There were a couple of times where... Uh, a ship would come through and we would shoot it down on site. Um, and what, what was the reason? They were our enemies. Uh, I was not privileged enough to know who exactly they were. Um, but you did witness it. Yes. There was one species who had these like black spherical ships. And whatever they were, they were our enemies. And we would shoot them down on site. And there were also these like... This one species who drove, rode around in these, like, white pyramid ships. They were actually really pretty. Uh, but whatever they were, we would shoot them on sight. So you never got, like, under siege by another race? Not that I recall. On any of the moons or settlements? And not while I was there. I heard stories from a couple of the other ones where that did happen, but it wasn't when I was there. Right. Then also, could you ever like pursue aspirations or dreams while you were there? And did you have any yourself? You could to a limited extent. You could have hobbies. Um, I remember I took up like painting what type of I, painting uh just like portraits of stuff and uh landscape scenes uh i think it was acrylic paint so you had shops where you could buy uh whatever type you wanted so you had some freedom there yes i lived basically what i would describe it as i was in a gilded cage like I was pretty okay. I was fairly comfy, but I was still in a cage, you know. Right. And were you actually decent at it? Probably better than what you are now, right? <laughs> yeah. After, like, 20 years. <laughs> like, did you have a realistic style or kind of avant-garde? Realistic. Uh, and I'm... I'd really like to know what happened to those paintings, actually, come to think of it, but... Hmm. And were yours the only eyes that ever saw them, or did you put them in a gallery or something? Not in a gallery. I occasionally put some in my office. Uh, occasionally someone else would see them and would, like, ask for one for their office. But supposing that you got really skilled, uh, you could probably you know, break through as an artist, just supposing that you were that good, like as a one-off, it was partly a meritocracy, right? So you wouldn't have been suppressed in that way. No, not really. If I had gotten to that level. Right. And returning to the business part, uh, how often did the ships smuggle cargo? And how, how strict were you about it? Oh, here's a funny... That's... Okay, that's a very interesting uh, question, actually. Um, there, there was a lot of smuggling. A lot of times, Solar Warden would supposedly confiscate it, but we didn't actually. We just had our own black market. Of course. Um, there was a doctor uh, who, she's not public, and I'm not, so I'm not going to say her name. But I do know who she is, who worked on our base. You know her from Disclosure, from YouTube? No, from personal contacts uh, I see. within the SSP community. But she's not public. She hasn't been out at all. Uh, and she... I would smuggle her coffee that was on these ships. And uh, I was actually quite strict, other than with coffee, but... 
I didn't really have much control over stuff once I found it and got it confiscated, so it would just end up back on the black market most of the time, and I couldn't really do anything about it, so. Was that because you were under surveillance, or? Or I just didn't have that power. You wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I was a very strict person, and I was a very angry person, so like, yeah. And were you subject to bribery? Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I mean, everyone has their price, yeah. And what, what would that come in form as? Usually, uh, it would be like, if there was something I wanted that was part of the contraband, like, I would allow it to get through if I got a cut. And can you give, like, one other example than coffee? What was the contraband? Like, maybe movies from Earth or media or stuff like that? Uh, maybe food? Yeah, well, not food so much, but yeah, media, um, pornography, uh, substances. Medicine, maybe? Yeah. yeah, medicine, um, alcohol, cigarettes. I would uh, sometimes take a Cuban cigar or two uh, if someone was smuggling those. And this doctor you were smuggling coffee for, was she the one that... It was part of that unfortunate incident with her assistant that led to that um, multiple homicide? Yes, she was. That was... Okay, there was a clone who was meant to be being programmed. His implants were meant to be being programmed for a specific purpose. I don't know what it was. Okay, but the doctor stepped out thinking that her assistant could handle this situation and the assistant massively fucked up <laughs> and she wound up triggering a different altar who's basically basically that altar she triggered his only thing was to kill everything that moved and destroy as much as possible so he came out he killed several guards and he completely destroyed the lab and, and uh, were you eyewitness to this I knew about it right as it, right after the fact. I happened to walk in right after some other guards had showed up and shot him and killed him. That must have been costly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that... what happened to the guilty party? The assistant? Yeah. Uh, she got ripped a new one. But <laughs> other than that, like, there's... Firing people doesn't really happen much. Unless they do something treasonous. So. And in that case, do they even do worse than firing? Yeah, I imagine this assistant got some brig time. Uh, right, but do they, uh, do they execute? Oh, people? yeah. Yeah. What for? Major treason, like leaking intel to the enemy or killing your boss or something like that. Right, right. Yeah. And on your job, did fights ever break out while attempting to arrest the crews of ETs that didn't play by the rules? Yeah, they did. Um, I've been involved in a few of those. I remember uh, trying to, having to arrest this one tall white female uh, who, she wasn't the tall white solar warden, she was a different kind. Uh, but I'm not sure. I think she might have been a Syrian. And by the way, for the audience, I mean Syrian as in the Sirius star system, not Syria, the country. No, I, uh, I'm pretty sure they know that. Okay, well, you know, you can never be too careful. <laughs> but um, I had to arrest her, and she put up a hell of a fight. Uh, in what way? Physically. Like, she was very skilled with martial arts. And, like, she... I pulled my gun, and she knocked it out of my hand. And so I had to, like, physically fight her and handcuff her. And it was tough. I'm not and sure where my my coworkers were, but, yeah. 
And uh, you, you carried, so you had to carry a pistol with you. And what kind was it? And how often did you have to resort to it? Not all that often. Uh, most of the people I was arresting weren't dumb enough to resist. Because, like, I mean, they were surrounded by military on all sides. I mean, it wasn't just me. There were armed people everywhere. So I it was not often that I had to pull it out. But it looked like a desert eagle. Um, sometime in the mid-80s, we upgraded to a new pistol that it still looked like a desert eagle, but it shot plasma rather than bullets. The earlier one shot, like, high-velocity bullets. So it was still more advanced than an earth gun, but... And does that apply to all the other types of rifles in Solar Warden? That they switched from conventional to plasma back in the 80s? Yeah. And have you ever been involved in, or at least seen footage of actual Solar Warden, like, battles or, or skirmishes? whether in ships or on, on the surface of planets? I've seen footage. Uh, well, and one time I did actually see one happening in the sky of Mars while I was standing on the surface. Yeah. What did that one look like? Just uh, Solar Warden cigar ships, like submarine-based ships battling triangle ones. I couldn't tell you who it was against. Were there explosions? Yeah. And you said they had submarine? Because I thought they had like buttresses and more elaborate designs on the, uh, the Solar Warden. And... Not in the early days. Uh, the earliest ships they had were converted submarines. And they were more advanced than our submarines, of course, because they had space flight. Like, and they had touch screens, but... It's shocking how behind the times Solar Warden was in its early days. We didn't even have FTL until the 80s. Right. And did you see out that battle, like uh, who won? I think Solar Warden did eventually. Uh, I would hope so for you. Yeah. And what about the one on the ground? Just briefly, uh, maybe a couple of sentences on that. I saw footage of one on the ground. I, I think it could have been Titan, because it it looked deserty, but it wasn't Mars, because it was it had like a yellow sky. So I think that's probably Titan, and it was against insectoids of some type, and they were they were not advanced. They had like spears, so. Actually, Solar Warden won that one pretty easily because they had guns, but... Of course. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that there was a weapon factory on the base, on Europa, and it produced a large variety of close combat weapons. And did you see any being used? I mean, I would think they were reserved for fights that happened on board ships, right? Yes, they were. Um, I didn't see them in use. Although, well, I did have one of the knives uh, in my boot. And, yeah, mm -hmm. they had bladed weapons that had diamond edges uh, because they were in the asteroid belt and in the Kuiper belt. Uh, diamonds are dirt cheap. And, of course, a diamond knife will cut through a lot more than a metal knife. So they use and that. And that's... That's because the, the asteroids are just split up planets, at least in that case, right? Yeah. And they even made axes and swords and uh, stuff that we associate with uh, the medieval era, right? They did. Interesting. And as far as the uh, job, did you only ever deal with ETs? And how great was the variety of species you interacted with? There was pretty great variety. And by the way, no, I, well, I have a talent for ETs, so usually it was. I didn't usually deal with the human ships, but occasionally I did, if it was a slow day or whatever. But lots of different kinds of reptilians and greys. 
a number of species of human, some of whom you could not tell the difference between them and us if you didn't run a DNA test. Um, okay, and before before we get further into the ETs, you mentioned that you also uh, saw human factions uh, landing there, and what was Solar Warden's relationship with them? It was usually like stiff diplomatic stuff. Uh, sometimes it was openly hostile, like with the Dark Fleet groups it was openly hostile but we still had to let them through um with like the corporate groups it was like cordial not friendly but not hostile oh and there was one other american group that we were very hostile towards um i believe it was the army ssp you see. Which Solar Warden is the Navy SSP. So, uh, for whatever reason, the Army had aligned with a different race, and so they were, we were openly hostile towards them. Even more so than with the Germans? No. They're but, still number one? Yes. Right. And did you ever witness a really ample-sized craft? And maybe some that looked like conscious or organic. Uh, I saw huge ones. I saw Draco motherships that were, they're black pyramids that are the size of a small planet. Whoa. Yeah, they are truly tremendous. But those couldn't have docked there. No, they would park in orbit and one of our shuttles would go up to do the inspection. Did you feel intimidated by them? Very much so. But uh, you didn't quite get a read on it. You just uh, just the shape of it instilled a bit of fear, right? Yeah. Uh, and you never got on board one of them yourself. Not in that phase. I I did in a different altar, but it was for an entirely different purpose. So that. So you were on board of uh, a ET mothership of planet size. Yes, a Draco one that... Whoa. Yeah. Uh, and that, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to just describe it in, in maybe a few words. Okay, basically it was one that had been found abandoned in the Oort cloud. Uh, and we were basically doing a salvage mission. And it was... Which faction? A dark Fleet. Right, right. And... Uh, it's hard to describe even. It was very sleek, black metal mostly. Um, there must have been something wrong with it for it to have been abandoned. Yeah, I, I'm assuming. Um, I and did know. they seize it? And it's in use for the Germans now? I don't think they were quite capable of using it. I think they just stripped it for whatever parts they could use. Right. And they might not have been the first scavengers. Probably not. Right. And did you ever get to learn, being a diplomat, any ET spoken languages, or such as the the one that Apollo mentioned, the galactic trade one? That's common. No, I'm. It was mostly telepathic. We had on our glass pads. We had a translator thing that was like galactic Google Translate. Um, but no, I didn't personally learn any of their languages that I recall. You didn't need them? No, I didn't. What about ET symbols? Did you learn any? And are they more efficient in your view than, than ours at conveying information? Yeah, they were, I would say, like, written Rigelian, for instance, is very similar to Hebrew but it is more efficient than most of our languages. And were you able to interpret it? I had, I would hold my glass pad up to it and it would translate it. So you're, as much as you were gifted in communication, you are still reserved to just one language, English. And German. Right, right. 
and Japanese, actually, but we didn't use Japanese very often. I see. Yeah. And also, you wrote a quip about the Martian raptors that were fleeing the German genocide on Mars. And this is the first because I didn't hear about them being anything above the Stone Age. So this tells me that they were still capable of spaceflight. And could you go over that uh, day? Okay, this was, I believe this was in the mid to late 70s. Uh, and I think for the most part they were Stone Age, but someone had donated them a ship. Uh, a few of them, they certainly didn't get all of their people there because they're still at war to this day on Mars. And yeah, basically they were fleeing the German genocide. They came through our checkpoint and uh, I remember asking them, it says you don't have a set destination here, where are you going? And they said, we don't know. We're being genocided. We're just going to go out into the galaxy and just try and find somewhere that'll take us. And were, did they exhibit contempt towards humans? Not contempt, just... Desperation? Yeah, and sadness. And, like, bewilderment at, like, why do you treat us this way? And you know. did... Did they look like the Jurassic Park Velociraptors, but with brawnier arms? Pretty much. And they stood upright. Uh, they didn't stand with their head forward. They stood upright. And they were multicolored and they had feathers, right? No, they did not have feathers. They were scales. Uh, they were, for the most part, they were... Uh, green with a strip of blue down their back. Some of them had brown spots, some of them had yellow spots. And they would annihilate any human in a close combat fight. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And are there some really unpleasant races that you encounter? Yes. Um, there's one plasma based species that they fly around in ships that are made of some type of crystal. And I believe they naturally, they inhabit gas giants, actually. Um, and they hate us. What would their appearance be describable as? Basically just a blob of light that can shift itself into whatever shape they wish. Like orbs? Yes. And what shape did they choose for humans? Uh, usually something they thought we would find scary. Uh, they would sometimes uh, shift into like a Draco looking thing and sometimes like a giant spider. Uh, I saw a couple of them shift into what looked like gargoyles. Uh, and if you told them to cut it out, would they? No. And... But you also mentioned that there were beings that we usually uh, regard as being really refined, like Arcturians. And you, you mentioned one who was delivering goods to the human colonies. And do you know who she was working for and did you get along with her? I got along with her quite well. Um, I, well, I actually did sleep with her a couple of times. Um, I believe she was working alongside some of the corporate groups. Um, her ship was, or her call sign, I don't remember what her ship was called. Her call sign was Spectra, S-P-E-C-T-R-A. She also had a Tau Ceti gentleman who was her co-pilot. There were a couple of Solaran Earth humans on her ship who were like cargo movers, and there were a couple of other species that I don't really know what they were. Um, were they doing this uh, just out of charity, or you know who they were working for? They were hired. I think it was a corporate group. I'm not sure which one. And did she not mind the height difference when you said that you, uh, you <laughs> scored? <laughs> no, she didn't too much. <laughs> Was she easy on the eyes? To me, she was. To some people, she wouldn't have been. She was 
I thought she was very pretty. Arcturians look like tall grays, but they're like lime green colored. Aren't they blue? There is a blue one also, but most of the ones I've met were green. Um, there's more than one species of Arcturian. I should make that clear. Makes sense. The green ones, yeah, I thought they were very pretty. Uh, Did you find the gray species to agree with you? And also, I was curious if the myth that they started out looking close to humans and they through, say, radiation, nuclear radiation, or just evolution or de-evolution, inherited that wiry shape. I think some of them naturally look like that. Uh, some of them definitely were more human-like originally. And I'm pretty sure it was actually through biochemical weapons rather than nuclear ones that caused that. But So there's truth to that. Yes. But like Arcturians, they naturally look like that. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And so did you find them you know, easy to talk to, or were they totally motionless, like we hear? For the most part, yeah. Um, so you weren't, they were forgettable for you? Pretty much, yeah. Right, right. And uh, you also wrote uh, something about aquatic beings that are still humanoid, and could you describe, like, how big the tanks are? Uh, not very big. Uh, just big enough to, like, like the size of a walk-in closet, I would say. Aren't they a little they would... crammed there? I mean, it's, isn't it a little claustrophobic? Well, on their ship, they have way more room. But when they would come off the ship, they would come off in those tanks. Right. And do they afterwards transfer into like the underground ocean on, on said planet or moon? Some of them did, yeah. But some of them were just passing through. I see. And who would you say you got along better with, humans or, or reptilians? Reptilians. That's um, not what I expected. Yeah, I... The humans I worked with, including myself, were assholes. Like, they really were. I'm, I'm not even trying to be funny. They really were. We were all just a lot of really angry people who had just been thrust into doing a job. And so that didn't do that well for, like, camaraderie. Right, but why reptilians in particular? Just, I don't know, they're... Most reptilians are actually pretty decent people who are just trying to get by, just like humans. Uh, Is some... it that they have an really pronounced sense of like honor and truthfulness and loyalty and stuff like that that too, yeah that and they're they're generally also pretty chill like and a lot of them have a pretty good sense of humor um so they're a lot like us in a lot of ways so but usually uh, physically stronger yes and right. typically they're on a whole different level most of the time Maybe because they've been around for so long. Probably, yeah. And uh, how about, did you ever witness a being with really strong presence that uh, was really evolved and that is what you could call like an interdimensional or higher density being? I, I think some of those plasma-based things might have been like higher dimensional. Um. Uh, and despite them being, like, really tricky and mischievous. Yeah. Just because something is from a higher dimension doesn't mean it's of any particular moral character. But they were... I think they were, like, higher density because of how they could change form and, like, their crystal ships and all of that. Like. So you're saying they actually shape-shifted, like, they rearranged the molecules of their body, not just a, a projected hologram. I'm not sure which it was. I think they did, like, physically change. But it could have been also like a projection. Mm -hmm. And the races, the other races that actually 
cohabited with you on the solar warden base. Um, did you get along with them and what was their attitude towards the humans? I got along with most of them. Um, I've mentioned that red ant being who was my landlord. I got along with him very well, actually. They were, most of the time, they were just kind of there. Um, they didn't have any very strong feelings for or against us as a species. I mean, they got along okay because they would work with us, but, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. So, how frequently were you called to the other checkpoints uh, of Solar Warden in the solar system? Maybe two or three times a year. And for extended periods? Not usually more than like two weeks. And let's let's take them one by one. So do you have any recall of Iapetus, which is the icy moon of Saturn? Yes, I have a couple of memories of that place. The Solar Warden base is positioned right next to a Draco colony. Not just a Draco base, a colony. That I did ask for a guided tour once, and they did take me on one. And it was, again, like black metal skyscrapers, mostly. Uh, all underground, of course. Oh, skyscrapers underground. That That's a first. Right, okay. Yeah, well, there are caverns, just like on Earth. There are caverns that are, like, miles deep on some of these moons and such. So... Yeah, it was under but underground, but not like in the inner surface, like in the big uh, hollow. I don't believe so. No. Right. And they and seem to it seems to be a theme with them. The black. Is it the ones that are, you know, partaking in black goo? Maybe. I think so. Yes. The royals and their underlings their Well, the royals and their military class. Uh, mostly. I don't think the workers have access to black goo. And did you feel like a midget there because yes. they're twice it? Yeah. Yes. And do, do they have like regular streets? And what what's the type of architecture? I'm curious. Architecture was just geometric like skyscrapers. Um, so they're very populous. Yes. And they were, they didn't have streets as such. Well, they did, but they were for pedestrians. To get around, they had, like, flying vehicles. Uh, of all shapes and sizes, I guess. Yeah. Right, and do you know, did you hear anything about the reason behind the huge equatorial ridge that makes it actually the third tallest mountain in the whole solar system, the the one that goes to three quarters of the way around Iapetus. No, I don't know anything about that. Right, you're more confined to the interior, but um, and also it's interesting because it has a very different surface composition between its two hemispheres, and um, it's also in a synchronous rotation around Saturn, so not not too much unlike our moon. So that suggests that it was artificially placed as well. Probably, yeah. Right, so let's move on to Titan, which is the second largest moon in the solar system. And it's the only acknowledged celestial body that has liquid bodies of water on the surface. And have you actually witnessed these liquids and were any of them like running? Yeah, it had rivers and like lakes of methane uh, on the surface. And... Uh, yeah, I witnessed those. It has mountains of water ice. Um, what about precipitation? It did rain. I think it rained methane, not water. Um, what color was it? Clear. And the sky was yellow. I think there was a high proportion of sulfur in the atmosphere. And there's a huge city there that's... It's mostly German, but it also has Solar Warden people there manning its checkpoint. Uh, and it's called New Nuremberg, and it's... I wrote an article about it, but, yeah. Right. And any other, like, standouts? 
in Iapetus or Titan, like something we need to know about? Titan, there's another facility, or well, another city, and this one is, it might actually be in the hollow because it was miles, it was at least miles underground, if not in the actual hollow inside. That is a huge, like, like in my first interview, I mentioned hub cities. Yes. That it has a whole bunch of races living there, including a few humans. And speaking of large moons, this one's the largest, and you have a recall of it as well, Ganymede. And is it true that it was big enough to actually have an atmosphere? Uh, I didn't notice much of an atmosphere. Not not enough of one to breathe without a suit. Uh, it did have some water vapor clouds. But, um, okay, there was a solar warden facility that was in a cavern. And there were, I just remember buildings on the ground level. And then, like, stuff, like the, the housing was up. Oh, uh, there was one other thing. There was, on the surface, actually, there was a Kruger base. It was under a dome, of course. It, Even if you could have breathed the air, which I don't think you could have, it would have been way too cold. Um, but I think minus, minus 200 Celsius. Yeah, something like that, yeah. And uh, there was a Kruger base there that I believe is actually Kruger headquarters. Other people dispute that, but... Um, and there was, like... A couple of skyscraper -y buildings, and they had better nightlife than the Solar Warden base. So whenever I was in the Solar Warden base, if I wanted to have a drink or whatever, I would head over to the Kruger base. So you could do such a thing on your free time while you were serving for Solar Warden? Yes. And they were better because they allowed you more stuff, or what? Hey. Yeah, and it was, like, livelier, you know. And were they also mainly Americans? Uh, Kruger is very diverse, actually. Uh, there were Americans, there were Germans, uh, there were Asians. I, I think they were probably Chinese, Chinese or Tibetan. And did they have a lot of, a lot of hardware inside them? Yes. And outside of them, too, a lot of the time. And did that get in the way, or was it just, you know, routine after a while? For some of them, I know it was really painful. Like, some people had, like, full metal skeletons, and those were excruciating. But just a few, like, implants, like a third eye implant here and there, or something like that, that didn't really get in the way. But they didn't look... That mechanical, like, say, in Alita or something, right? They were still human, mainly. Yes. Right, interesting. And so let's move on to Enceladus, which is the smaller moon of Saturn. And it's well known for having thermal vents and a liquid ocean that's at least 10 kilometers deep. And did you hear or witness any sentient life there, considering the vastness? I'm sure there was. I didn't go that far down. Um, what I remember was in, it was partially on the surface, the checkpoint was, and then the living quarters were under the checkpoint. And I just remember like a lot of ice everywhere. Oh, and this was close to a cryovolcano where there was like liquid water geysers erupting out of it. And any memories from Enceladus? They called me there because there was one, some variant of Grey that was coming through the checkpoint that their people were really struggling to communicate with. So they called me for my talent. Uh, right. I don't know what this species was, but yeah. And do you uh, recollect your experiences on Mars? Maybe uh, unlike the other bodies, you could even walk on the surface of it. And did you? Yeah, you could, and I did once. I remember watching the sunset, uh, and, well, I've been to Mars in a bunch of different altars in different time periods, but this was in early to mid-70s through 
the mid to late 90s when I was making visits to Mars. And it was a huge pain in the ass getting from Europa to Mars because, of course, you have to go through the asteroid belt, which that would, depending on orbital placement or orbital proximity, uh, getting from Europa to Mars would take anywhere from three to nine hours on basically like the most nauseating, bumpy roller coaster you can imagine. That's what going through the asteroid belt was like. Um, and you could see this out the window, I mean, transparent metal or something? Yes, yes. But it, it took long, but it, I would guess that you didn't have danger of having accidents or anything. Oh, no, we did. That's why it was like so nauseating and bumpy, because we were avoiding collisions, constantly ducking and weaving around asteroids. So there are that many of them? Yes. Yeah, there are. Okay, and also, lastly, about these other bases, um, you mentioned one on Neptune, and I guess it wasn't on the surface because it's not livable there, and uh, it was inside a bubble habitat. Yes, and I've come to realize it actually wasn't Neptune, it was Uranus, um, so a different ice giant, but yeah, and it was, I actually went there when I had a few days off, and this was a proper colony, not just a military base, and it was somewhat like Cloud City in Star Wars, it was floating in the atmosphere of Uranus, um, it, it didn't, it wasn't open on the top, like in Star Wars. It had like a glass dome. So and it, it was, was flat underneath? Yes. So you it could was, say that's the flat Earth. <laughs> yeah. It was basically like a disc that was like roughly the size of Texas. Holy um, moly. Yeah, it was. A, and we didn't build it, by the way. It was there way before us. We just were the, we're just the most recent inhabitants. It was just left there? I don't know if it was just left there or if we took it over. Maybe but it was part of some trade deals or something. Maybe, yeah. And what was like life in one of those? It was actually pretty luxurious. There were like gardens, uh, botanical gardens for aesthetic purposes, not even just to grow food. In Solar they Warden? Were, uh, yeah, on the Uranus base or city that I'm talking about. Um, oh, and right. They, so they they weren't limited to Solar Warden. There were many other species. Uh, yeah, there were other species living in this, on this station thing. I, I really need to figure out a proper term for it, but uh, there were other species living there, but Solar Warden had also uh, set up shop there, and there were, it was a proper American colony. Uh, and... Do you know the actual thinking, the rationale behind uh, having a, a bubble near a planet? Is it that it confers some safety from, like, I don't know, comets because you're closer to the equator? and Or is it just the proximity to um, the portals? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. Um, I think it was just a nice place to live. And you also said that you had been on one of its moons? Yeah, one of the moons of Uranus um, at a checkpoint. I don't remember much except that it was in a crater, domed over again, and they had melted some of the ice in the crater and made like an artificial lake uh, in the middle of the base. So there were the buildings were up around the edge of this artificial lake. Was it just aesthetic, or was it actually potable, the water? I'm assuming it would have been potable. Um, right. I don't well, know. So let's, let's move on to the last stretch here, which is your overall impressions of the service. Did it leave you with, like, a positive aftertaste? And did it compare favorably to Nachtwaffen, or not? Really? No, it compared quite disfavorably, actually, in my opinion. Um, the extent to which I was used by them is... 
I, I'm actually still working, having to let go of a lot of bitterness about the way I was treated by the Americans. Um, that they took me, they cloned me, they didn't give my clone even the luxury of fake memories. He just woke up an adult with no memories. And then they just shoved him into his job, and he had no choice. So, so you had fake memories, and you would rather not have any at all? No, I would rather him have had fake memories, because he had a major identity crisis. Because he didn't know where he was from or anything. Right. Uh, yeah. And the, the Germans are more upfront, less deceitful. Yes, I would say so. And the higher-ups at Solar Warden, are they against or pro-disclosure movement? I'd say, well, I'd say most of them are against it because they're, they want to maintain their position in the pyramid, which they can't really if everyone knows about them. Some of the higher-up, like, military people specifically probably are because they swore an oath to protect Earth. So I imagine some of them are in favor of it, but they're not the ones in power. Right, right. And do you see this suppression bubble bursting anytime soon? And what would you say is the biggest weak spot? Uh, I'd say the biggest weak spot is this community and the abundant proof that we have. And also that memory seems to be triggered, uh, you know, in an accelerated way. And there's only so much you can cover up. And also maybe some celestial influences that are making people get triggered and red pills and whatnot. Yeah. Well, and also for the people who say we have no evidence physically, first of all, we do. And second of all, in most legal systems, Eyewitness testimony counts as evidence. So, yeah, I've been actually trying to get some some of my SSP friends on board with like suing the government, but that's a whole different subject. <laughs> well, what do you think they, uh, seeing as it's an inevitability that they will come to light at some point? How do you think the the disclosures will affect the space affairs? How will they have to adjust? They'll have to get used to uh, regular people knowing things. And they'll have to really get used to uh, everyone protesting slavery. And I mean everyone, because also people in the breakaway colonies are mostly in the dark about the slavery. So when that comes to light, they're going to have a big thing on their hands. So, But there is no way out, right? Because... It's come to a head, you would say, within maybe five or so years, that's max, right? I hope so. I really hope so. Um, I've had enough of not being taken seriously, as have all of us. I've had enough of not being acknowledged by the people who abducted us. And one thing I would say is, because I was in Solar Warden, and also in the American Dark Fleet branch... Both of those are run by the Navy, which means I did service in the Navy. And according to the law, I am owed a pension and a DD-214. Where is it? You know? You you don't even get acknowledgement. Yeah. But, so, given that you were specifically altered and you did this uh, communication, alien communication, for 50 years... Mm -hmm. Has some of that carried through uh, in your here and now? And have you been able to send or receive like messages from ETs or at least humans? Yeah, I have. Well, I've done this sort of job in multiple altars. Um, when we do the next show with Joseph, I'll go into how I was doing that in the Dark Fleet. But yeah, I generally, if someone walks within like five feet of me, I'll pick up at least a little on their thoughts. Um, that was part of why during the pandemic, I actually was rather relieved for the first little bit because everyone was scared of getting close to anyone. So I wasn't constantly hearing people's thoughts. 
So you can't block it out? I can some, but like to a limited. And, and you know for a fact that it's not just a hallucination. You have like uh, verified it to yourself. I can sometimes send it back to people and they'll like turn and look at me or something really? like that. Yeah. Maybe the ones that are already psychically inclined or, or yeah. anyone. I, I think that they're psychically inclined already, um, even and if they don't actually, know it. Sorry, have you actually carried a full dialogue this way? I've never found anyone who wasn't completely freaked out when I tried to. So, so you haven't found anyone to volunteer, because you, you probably would be able to. Mm-hmm. Right. And also, my last question is, which one of the aforementioned locations did you enjoy the most and maybe would like to visit? I'd like to go back to the Uranus station colony. The it was one. Yeah, it was actually pretty cool. And I don't really care about the Europa. Well, I actually would like to go back to the corporate colony that was underwater on Europa. The American one in the cave that I lived in, I don't really care about, but Europa was like breathtakingly beautiful. So I'd like right. to revisit as a tourist, not in the military. Yeah, maybe, maybe one day. And um, yeah, you really provided a lot of info and clarified a lot of stuff. So I want to thank you and I'm hopeful to catch you next time. I think we discussed doing one with Joseph, who you have shared memories with, right? Yes. And till next time, uh, have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye.